Hello, my name is Dr. Jeff Healy and I am an anaesthetist and consultant in pre-hospital and retrieval medicine with Sydney Hems. This session will cover the medical team approach to motor vehicle accidents. Before I continue, a quick disclaimer. This presentation will show images of a graphic nature for the purposes of medical education. The images shown provide a glimpse of the nature of the accident scenes that we face every day in this line of work. The information presented is in line with the accumulation of experience of our teams in both Australia and the United Kingdom. However, I appreciate that local protocols may vary in other countries and local interdisciplinary training with rescue agencies is highly recommended. So why is this important? Motor vehicle accidents or road traffic crashes are very common and they cause a large percentage of the traumatic injuries and deaths from trauma we see worldwide. For those working in or about to embark on a career in pre-hospital medicine, an appreciation of the hazards, the approach, the stages of extrication and optimal teamwork and interaction will make these jobs run much smoother and will ultimately benefit our patients. It is vital that the medical team be safe, provide an advantage to patient care, and certainly not a hindrance to the rescue or slowing down of the extrication of patient or patients. And that will be the underlying theme throughout the whole presentation. So before you enter one of these accident sites, Medical teams should be afforded the opportunity to practice these skills and have an approach to extrication led by instructors experienced in, experienced in highlighting the dangers that they'll be exposed to so that when they first set foot on scene, they have an appreciation of these factors. It's important to realize that the cognitive load can be so high when the first time you approach one of these scenes that simple things such as personal protective equipment, where to place your bags, who to talk to, can be complex procedures that absorb part of your bandwidth and can slow down the process of assessing the patient, getting them out and providing the meaningful interventions that they require. So they should be second nature and they should happen without having to spend your valuable bandwidth on. So before we go any further, it's really important to highlight the fact that you need to speak the same language as the rescue agencies when you arrive on scene. It's no use going into the medical, uh, the music store, sorry, asking for the red hot chili papers and the s shop assistants laughing at you. It's not gonna benefit you getting that record. And similarly, <laughs> when you arrive on scene and you don't know what to call things or call things a different manner, it provides less confidence in the rescue agency's ability to liaise with you and it means that you may ultimately slow down the treatment of the patient that you're trying to help when you're on scene. So this slide gives you a couple of the quick basics that you need to know. First of all, the arrow on the right of screen shows the A pillar and that is the pillar or post from the windscreen to the side of the car that is the first post you come across from moving from the front of the car to the back. The second post you come to, or second pillar you come to, is the B pillar, seen on the left arrow. If the, the car has multiple other pillars from there on, then they would be called the C pillar and the D pillar and so on. Why is that important? Well, that might be where they're making cuts or pushing against. So it's important to know what you're touching, what might be cut, and what might be moving next. The other important major things are the seats, the steering wheel, and obviously the dashboard. The dashboard can be a compressive force that can be on the patient's legs, and that might need to be rammed or removed or pushed back by the fire service or fire rescue agency. So it's important to know what people are talking about when they're using these terms. So when you arrive on scene, there are six essential stages of extrication that, that the scene may evolve through, and these are what the fire and rescue agencies focus upon. 
The first one is scene safety and an adequate scene assessment. The next one is stabilization of the vehicle or vehicles with initial access into the vehicle. The third aspect is adequate glass management. This is an active process to try and prevent further harm from glass to not only the patient, but also the rescuers. The fourth aspect is space creation. Once they've got initial access, they want to provide enough space around the patient to be able to allow the medical teams to do initial treatments, but also to be able to then move the patient out of the vehicle. From space creation becomes full access, and we'll go through some of these pictures and show you what full access might be. And that allows 360 degree access to the patient and facilitates onward extrication. The very last stage of extrication is the immobilization and patient management with recognized extrication techniques. We will reflect on all of these stages of extrication as we look at all of the slides henceforth through this presentation. And I want you to place yourself in the situation of these pictures that we show you and have a think about not only the hazards, the scene safety aspects, the stabilization and initial access, but also the full aspects, full access process and how you're gonna be getting the patient out or what interventions you might need to do where they are. So these are hazardous environments and you certainly don't want to be a hindrance to the rescue of a patient. You certainly don't want to slow down their removal. So you need to be adequately protected and you need to be adequately dressed for the job. And that includes a helmet, eye protection, a dust mask if they're cutting glass, and I'll come back to that in a second, overalls or definitely a flight suit or agency long sleeve and long legged clothing, protective boots, and some HEMS organizations decree that they must be steel capped. You must have medical gloves and also access to debris gloves if you're touching metal objects, sharp metal objects. The last thing you wanna do is accidentally touch a very sharp object that's a cut bit of metal in a car and cut your hand and then expose yourself to blood and body fluids in the rescue process. It's also important to realize that you might be first on scene and that there are very simple measures such as stopping traffic, turning the engine off and removing the keys and patient reassurance, which can be very valuable once you are safely, appropriately tired on scene. The other thing that's really important to remember is in Australia and in other countries, the police have overall scene control and the fire service or fire and rescue agency often have overall safety control of the scene. And they may not let you into the scene if there is a definitive hazard that can place you at risk and you need to follow their instructions. So there are many hazards involved in placing yourself into this environment. Here's a picture of a recently deconstructed car from an extrication training exercise with Sydney Hems. You can see that the A pillar is intact and the B pillar or B post has been removed and both doors have been removed. A special protective cover or octopus is over the steering wheel that would prevent a deployment of an airbag if it hadn't already been deployed. And there's a protective plumbing cylinder on the superior aspect or the top aspect of that B pillar to prevent you from bumping your head against that sharp material. But again, there's also a sharp metal exposed on the bottom of that B pillar. So there are lots of sharp hazards and lots of other hazards in that area. If airbags have been deployed, there might be a large amount of dust that stops the airbag from sticking to each other in the uh, containment device. And that can also be inhaled and cause precipitation of other respiratory conditions like asthma. And there might be undeployed 
seatbelt pretensioners, gas struts, or even just hazardous, hazardous chemicals in the vehicle or vehicles involved. And the emerging problem of the chemicals contained in the batteries stored in hybrid vehicles that we need to be aware of. This is a commercial device that is placed over a steering wheel to prevent the airbag deploying and injuring a rescuer. Again, it will still cause a large amount of uh, noise and will certainly frighten both the rescuers and the patient if it is deployed even underneath these protective devices. This slide shows a curtain airbag which has been deployed and the fire service have cut through across or transversely across the vehicle and even cut through that airbag. But remember, there might be a gas canister that deploys that airbag still in that B pillar or in the curtain aspect itself. This short video will show you from a, a, a lot of the, the mid 90s, show you deployment of a airbag and the result of the rescuing staff. They were injured when the car's airbags unexpectedly exploded. Firefighters Jim Collar and Tom Trimbach were trying to remove two trapped people from a wrecked 1994 Mitsubishi Galant when the airbags popped and hit the rescuers. Both required hospital treatment but were not seriously injured. Slowing the video down, you can see firefighters were well into the extrication when the airbags popped. Mitsubishi spokesman Kim Custer says there were only two reasons for the airbags to deploy. Either the car's battery remained connected or firefighters accidentally created an electrical short while cutting through a wiring harness in the center of the car. So you can see by that very rapid expansion of that airbag that the firefighter in this situation was between the airbag and the patient and could have seriously injured himself and the patient in that process. So they need to be treated with respect and you need to give them a wide berth if you can. <clears throat> this accident scene shows you the other hazards that we face routinely. And that is that it can be nighttime. Remember accidents happen 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And also the fact that it's been recently raining and there's a large amount of mud around this vehicle. So this vehicle has had a, a, a the attempts at stabilization with the rear struts, but it's still in mud. And they can be diff difficult to fully stabilize. You can see that the policeman at the left of screen is almost slipping over in the mud trying to get through the scene itself. Poor light, poor sound control, because often the power associated with all of the tools for extrication and lights are from generators, so there'll be a large amount of noise. There's often flashing lights from the emergency vehicles. And so it's difficult to control the environment to be able to have control over the other aspects of the scene as well. When you approach these scenes, it's really important to look up and around. In this situation, you can see that the power pole that has been struck by a vehicle has almost completely separated the foundation of that power pole and it is being suspended by the electrical wires themselves. That uh, telegraph pole can fall on the rescuers. It can bring down electrical wires and it is a significant hazard to the scene and potentially needs to be secured before you uh, walk anywhere near that. Another hazard is glass and it's one of the six stages of extrication is the management of which the glass. We know that safety glass will shatter into small places, small pieces to be able to prevent shards of glass injuring patients and rescuers. But that small aspect of glass can still cause significant injuries and will go through all the patient's clothing and area of the car. If glass is being cut, we know that the small silica particles can be inhaled and can cause uh, further respiratory diseases long term. Uh, very similar to asbestos fibers and so forth. So occupational exposure to silica fibers is an emerging problem and we need to pay attention to it. If we are arriving by air, there is another significant factor and that is the other traffic around the accident site. 
it is very common that people slow down to look at an accident scene and can cause subsequent accidents on the other side of the carriageway. And indeed, if you're going to land a helicopter on a roadway, it causes an enormous amount of fascination from other motor vehicle uh, users and it can cause subsequent injuries to both rescuers and other people. So there are often protocols in place in helicopter emergency medical systems where both sides of the road on a dual carriageway type process like this picture depicts needs to be stopped so that the aircraft can land safely without potential for further risk of injuries. This shows the amount of fluid that can come out of a car, particularly oil and petrol, that's been attempted to be decontaminated by sawdust or sand on scene. It's very important to realise that unlike in the movies, cars don't tend to explode, but they certainly are at flammable risk depending on the nature of the, the accident that's been involved. In subsequent slides, you'll also be able to see that fire agency, fire and rescue agencies often have a dedicated fire and rescue officer with a charged fire hose standing at the front of the vehicle for fire suppression duties if the event of a spark or ignition then occurs. And that person, if you ask them to do something, won't comply with your requests because that's their duty and that's their only duty for that accident scene until the patients are out of the vehicle. As we've already mentioned about with the mud and the night is also the impending weather. And that affects not only your deployment to scene if it's a rotary wing uh, helicopter type transfer, but also what's gonna happen when you arrive. That might be that you are in torrential rain as this picture might depict of the weather radar in Sydney. You need to have adequate protection for the weather yourself and realize the constraints of your treatment and what you might need to do in terms of meaningful interventions and where you might do them. And that weather might be the reason why the accidents occurred in the first place, as this large tree has fallen onto this bus. You can imagine that if the wind's still there, there might be at the risk of other trees coming down and the uh, ability to be able to control your environment might be almost zero and you need to take that into consideration where you're planning to place your medical equipment or your kit dump and also where you're placing your ambulances and helicopters and how you're going to be able to get the patient out of the vehicle or patients out of the vehicle and also how you're going to get them subsequently to hospital. Not only are there risks to the rescuers but also to the patient in the extrication process. So it's important to have a think about patient protection. You can see in this picture of two hard uh, plastic teardrops placed over the front of the patient and hearing protection in his ears to protect him from the noise and also the cutting uh, instruments and spreading instruments and also from any glass getting on him. You can see that he's got IV access He's holding onto his mobile phone very carefully and he's got immobilization and spinal protection from a patient, a ambulance crew in the back seat of the vehicle. They are incredibly difficult environments to try and control. They are noisy. They can be very bright or very dark. There can be an enormous amount of emotion going on from bystanders and patients themselves. And we need to be able to control those aspects that we talk about regularly in pre-hospital and retrieval medicine. Try and control yourself, the environment, the patient, and the team to be able to optimize patient care. So the approach to these accident scenes is really important. You can see in this picture, there are already established ambulance crews on scene. There are a large number of fire and rescue officers on scene already into the six stages of extrication. The bottom of the screen you can see there is a fire and rescue kit dump. They have got their mechanical tools out and their access tools and it's certainly a place where you don't want to put your medical equipment. 
There is a charged fire hose that you can see there's a small amount of water that's come out the end of, and there's an officer that obviously is in charge of that for fire suppression duties. There is a road that is potentially still active on the other side of this accident that you need to be aware of. There is, in the next picture of the other side of this scene, you can see that the patient is still in the vehicle. The vehicle is being stabilized with chocks and stocks. The glass windscreen has been broken or cut and reflected back across the front aspect of the vehicle. There are another important couple of important things in this picture. The fire and rescue officer with the red helmet is clearly the fire and rescue team leader. And he is the liaison point for the medical team in terms of how the rescue is going, what the time frame of getting the patient out is, and a, a discussion of what their plan A and their plan B is. You can see that some of the fire and rescue agency officers have dust masks on that are often involved in the cutting of glass process. Looking back again from the other side of this scene, you can see that the people involved in this medical team response have walked around the entire scene in the involvement of the assessment of the scene and the patient. On the other side of the vehicle, you can see an ambulance crew with a orange tabard on, and that is the incident controller. And here's another important point to, to liaise with in terms of how many patients there are, who's the sickest one that the medical team might go to first, what the transport decisions might already have been made, and how much resources we have on scene, whether that's adequate for the number of patients we have. At that point, it's also important to liaise with them subsequently at regular time periods if it's a prolonged extrication to be able to keep everyone informed and have closed loop communication style skills deployed at this scene to make sure everyone's in the loop. A different accident scene quite nicely shows this fire and rescue kit dump process. A charged fire hose running from the vehicle across the scene and a large canvas sheet that's been placed down with their equipment laid out nicely so they can access it methodically, clearly and safely. So as you approach the scene, I think it's incredibly important to assess the forces that have been applied to the vehicle and the patients involved in this accident. I want you to actively think about how fast the vehicle may have been going and how much applied forces have been placed on the vehicle and the patient involved and how they may have moved through that process. Remember, if the patient's rolled over, if the car is rolled over, the patient might not be in the seat that they were originally in and they may or may not have been restrained through that process. So reading the wreckage of this picture, you can see that there is a very large amount of passenger compartment intrusion on the passenger side of this vehicle. There is a patient still in the driver's side of the vehicle and he has been actively managed by the medical team at that stage. If you were to conceptually think of a patient in the passenger side of this vehicle, the amount of force applied to that side of the car would often result in a patient being deceased in this sort of mechanism. Reading the wreckage of this incident, you can see that through the six stages of extrication, the, the car has been stabilized. You can see the chocks and stocks on either side. And it's such st so stabilized that there's even fire and rescue officers standing on the vehicle. The glass management is provided by the the canvas tarps through the windows and over the front dashboard. I would imagine further out of scene, you would see that the bus has also been stabilized as well. And there are now in the stages of creating space and providing full access for the patient. Reading the wreckage, you'll see that there has been a, a large frontal impact of this vehicle and the patient would be at risk subsequently then of having femoral and tib fib injuries, pelvic injuries, potentially abdominal and chest injuries with the dashboard 
um, compartment intrusion forward. This is another side impact vehicle. You can see that the airbags have been deployed. They have done a B pillar release reflecting the front driver's side door out. The front windscreen has been removed or cut, reflected forwards. And they've removed the roof for access to the patient. Again, if there was a passenger in the front passenger seat, they would undoubtedly be deceased from the force of their in intrusion into the passion compartment space. The driver itself would have had a side translated movement and could have left-sided injuries, predominantly chest, pelvis, abdominal injuries, and left arm and leg injuries, and may very well have contra coup type injuries of the head moving sideways during the accident. It's important to actively go and have a look at the car and look around the car. The picture on the lower right side of the screen, you can see that the car doesn't look too bad. The fire service, the fire rescue service have done an A pillar, B pillar cut and taken off the roof and the doors of this vehicle. But when you look at the top left picture, you can see the enormous amount of passenger compartment intrusion there is on the driver's side and it has forced the driver's seat across the midline of the vehicle. It is highly likely that the patient would have significant or life-threatening injuries associated with this amount of force translocated onto their body. In this picture, you can see that this car has caused a large amount of damage to the street furniture around it. So that's a very important thing to look at as well. You can see that there is a telegraph or power pole that has been bent over at the ground, right angles. There's a large amount of dirt and disruption of the surrounding surroundings of it. And it looks as though this patient, uh, this vehicle has rolled because of the all four compartment damage to the vehicle and the, the aspect of all of the damage around the vehicle. This vehicle has been chocked. You can see the black chocks at the front. It is, they've had a glass management by removal of the front windscreen or cutting of the front windscreen. Initial access has been opening the door and then the full access has been cutting of both A pillars, B pillars, C pillars and removal of the roof. It's important to make an assessment as to whether the patient was restrained in the rollover as to where they might end up in the vehicle or even if they're ejected from the vehicle. This is another common mechanism of injury type we see, and that is a motorcycle going into the side of a road vehicle. In this situation, you often have multiple patients to be able to look after. But by reading the wreckage, you can see that there has been a side impact on the driver's side of the motor vehicle, the black motor vehicle. There's been a large amount of debris spread across the road, both from the motor car and the motorcycle and it is on a particularly straight bit of road that potentially is a high speed road. The front of the motorcycle has had severe damage and the petrol tank of the motorcycle is significantly deformed, which often corresponds with severe pelvic injuries as the motorcyclist goes forward as the motorcycle stops. You can also see the significant scarring and goring into the road of the metal of the uh, deceleration of both the motor vehicle and the motorcycle. So these are accidents with high transmission forces across both the motor vehicles and the patient's bodies themselves. And it gives a clue as to the patterns of injuries that you might see. This next slide shows you again another regular pattern of injuries we see and that is the patient that is not inside the vehicle, the patient that is initially outside the vehicle, and that is a pedestrian versus car accident. In this particular picture, you can see that the patient has hit the front of the vehicle, has deformed the front bonnet, often with their upper body in adults, or their head in children, and they've progressed, presumably due to the speed of the vehicle, through the windshield of this car. The patient may be in various different points of still being in that car as the medical teams and rescue teams arrive.
This picture shows a large tree that's fallen onto a bus and it's preventing access to the back of the bus from this very small road in the United Kingdom. So you need to realise that you might not be able to access the full scene initially and be able to have some sort of communication either with a second team on the other side or rescuers on the other side of this tree or have a plan of how you might access both aspects of this vehicle. The other thing, it's very important for all accidents, but particularly pedestrian accidents, to have a look at the vehicle and have a look at the damage to the windscreen. Particularly this bullseye, you can see that there's been the remnants of hair and human tissue left on the screen. And that's significantly, uh, it shows significant injury and transmission of force to that patient. Um, and it might indicate the amount of force that's been translated onto that patient's head. In vehicles that don't have a bonnet, such as buses and large vans, that force might not be potentially absorbed by the uh, translation onto the bouncy bonnet, but it might be straight towards the head in such a flat vehicle such as this bus. And again, there may be human tissue, hair, blood on that windscreen that indicates uh, the point of contact for the patient. This picture depicts a patient that has had a glancing blow. It's obviously a bullseye or spider web on the windscreen and the patient may have gone over the side of the vehicle and also hit the rear mirror or wing mirror of the car and that might uh, signify injuries to the upper limbs and shoulders area and chest. That patient may have also uh, landed at a significant distance from this vehicle and may be distant to this scene when you first arrive as part of the medical team. So it's important to go back and have a look at those vehicles and make an assessment and be able to pass that information on to the trauma team leader when you arrive at the major trauma scene. When you are having a look at the windscreen, you might make an assessment of whether that damage is caused from the inside out or the outside in. And this picture shows the damage that's caused by an unrestrained patient with an airbag that's been deployed for a patient hitting the windscreen unrestrained. And there was human tissue on the inside of this window and you can see that it's been pushed outwards. The next aspect of reading the wreckage is the advantage if you arrive by air. And so looking out the side of your helicopter can provide you with a large amount of information. And in some circumstances, the police might ask for some information from the air as well. And that gives an indication of the distances from the vehicles that might have traveled. And you can see in this picture a large heavy goods vehicle or truck that has come off the road after colliding with the blue vehicle to the left of the picture. And it might give you an indication of not only how many cars and patients might be involved, the extent of the distance between the two vehicles that you might need to move between. <clears throat> and also the nature of the services already on scene. The last part of reading the wreckage, it's really important to realize that in certain circumstances we may land at a site distant from where the road traffic collision or motor vehicle accident is. And the ambulance crews might be transporting that patient to rendezvous with us at a local landing zone like an oval. If we can, always asking the crews what the scene looked like, what sort of damage was placed to the car, and if they have a photo of it, taking a photo of that is really valuable. It can provide you with an enormous amount of information, and you can take a photo of that and then subsequently show that to the trauma team leader when you arrive at hospital for an essence of what the scene looked like. These accident scenes can be incredibly large. There can be multiple vehicles involved and there can be huge transmission of forces. This picture quite nicely depicts multiple vehicles involved. They've both been stabilized. They're in the initial stages of creating access. You can see that the fire and rescue agency or the SES in this situation on the right of screen are removing the driver's side door of the vehicle. 
there is a fire and rescue officer standing with a charged hose for fire suppression duties. And the train involved in hitting these two vehicles has been secured by the fire and rescue agency and the relevant train authority. If there is any aspect of any live electrical con conduction through the train lines or overhead wires, this needs to be isolated and secured and switched off prior to any rescue involvement. And there are specific protocols in place in each country and each area for uh, the correct um, maneuvers and situations to control the safety aspects of these jobs. So what I want to show you now is a motor vehicle accident. Uh, the airbags have been deployed and this is now in the create space section of the six stages of extrication. You can see quite nicely that the B pillar has removed, been removed at the top and bottom aspect of that pillar. The front driver's side door and rear driver's side door has been removed with that B pillar rip or B pillar removal. The driver's side has been laid flat and a spine board or rigid extrication board has been able to be placed underneath that patient and they've been able to be moved out in a reasonably slow and controlled manner to try and reduce clot disruption and have good spinal immobilization. One really important thing that you can overlook in this picture is that there's a child seat in the back of this car. Unfortunately, we still see accidents to this day where there are multiple patients involved. There is one patient that receives a large amount of interest, often because of either their injuries or the way that they're behaving, and that there might be still multiple patients involved and that patient might be ejected, as in the case of a child, or maybe in the lower footwell of the rear aspect of that seat. So it's important to liaise with the rescue agencies and make sure that you've accounted for all patients especially if there are child seats or child restraints that have been used. This picture depicts and shows the multi-agency liaison with a patient that is involved in a motor vehicle accident. He is still in the vehicle and they're at the create space stage or extrication stage. There is a pneumatic um, spreader that's been placed against the B-pillar um, base and it's doing a dashboard roll for this patient and it's moving the dashboard off the legs of this patient. It's important to see that uh, there are lots of people in the vehicle and there are multiple hazards around that vehicle. All of the patients, uh, sorry, all of the rescuers have their proper PPE on and there is a, a what's called a Kendrick extrication device that's been placed around the patient that's seated in the front seat of this car. And that's to help remove them once they've created the space and done the dashboard roll. You can see the monitoring leads going across the dashboard onto, onto the patient. It's important to realise that you, although you need to balance the advantages of having good monitoring on throughout the whole extrication process, and that might take half an hour, an hour, and up to two hours on some of these patients, or more. The point at which that patient moves, that monitoring and IV access or IV fluids might all become disrupted and become a tangle hazard and that needs to be properly managed and thought out of in advance before moving these patients. Okay, so let's talk about plan A's and plan B's. A good plan A Although what may seem outwardly like a slow process of getting a patient out in a slow and controlled manner with full spinal immobilization and reduction of any clot disruption of these patients, that can outwardly seem very methodically slow, is in certain situations very appropriate for the nature of the patient's injuries. But in others, it can be... Uh, entirely inappropriate. For example, if a patient has rapidly declining uh, physiology, then there's no need to slowly take this patient out if they're going to die in the process of getting them out slow and in a spinal immobilized clot minimal disruption type way. 
and that patient that is rapidly declining will need to progress to a plan E, plan B type extrication and that might be what's termed a rapid extrication or rapid X in some fire and rescue agencies to the point where spinal mobilization has become less of a priority and the extrication of that patient might be more in the order of a minute or two. Now these in most circumstances can be done quite easily but it's important to liaise with the incident commander or fire and rescue officer in charge that they have a plan A and what the plan B would be for the removal of this patient. Some services may not be so au fait with the term plan B or a rapid extrication process and I've certainly heard in the past medical teams say to fire incident commanders or fire rescue uh, in charge officers uh, if the patient deteriorates in such a way there's no need to take a slow period of time to get them out because they will be they will be dead or if this car was to immediately burst into flames how would you get the patient out and that would be our plan B now these have to be a very sensitive approach certainly these the fire and rescue officers are experts in dealing with extrication and certainly we don't want to get these teams offside by our manner of interaction certainly it needs to be non-confrontational and in the patient's best interest in a graded assertiveness type manner as we do in a lot of our interactions with other agencies but it, I, I really think it's important to delineate what your plan A and plan B is early on so that if a change in patient condition happens then you can flip from plan A to plan B rapidly. So let's go through this. This is a picture of a car that has gone sideways into a large power pole. They are in the stages of move past um, car stabilization. They've got chocks and stocks on both sides. They've gone through the stages of trying to create space but obviously that telegraph pole or power pole is got a large intrusion into the patient compartment. This particular case, the patient subsequently became obtunded and dropped their GCS and then blew a pupil. So they had a dilated, unresponsive or unreactive pupil. At this point, the medical team asked the fire and rescue team to change from plan A to plan B for a rapid extrication process so that they could manage their airway, provide osmotic therapy for their severe head injury and manage their other injuries rapidly through meaningful interventions on scene and rapid transfer to a major trauma center. It's very important to realize that there are lots of these terms out here that we need to understand. And the next term that I think is really important to understand is trap by compression or trap by confinement. This picture graphically shows the nature of the small amount of space involved in the patient that was the driver of this vehicle. And you can easily see blood stains and damage to the steering wheel and the seat and the front dashboard compartment. Patients can be initially deemed to be trapped by compression, but a thorough assessment might be able to show that it's just patient's footwear or boots or clothes that might be trapping them there and if able to be removed that footwell area might be sufficient space for the legs to be able to be moved out of the way and they're not necessarily compressed by the uh, wreckage of the vehicle but they might be just confined by the process or the position of where they are. It's very important to try and get an assessment of what the lower limbs are like in the uh, situation like this picture depicts. So moving through the six stages of extrication, let's start thinking about what the medical team's priorities are for the assessment and treatment of these patients. Now it's very important to try and get an thorough, as thorough as possible assessment of the patient in the vehicle to forward plan to be two steps ahead of the process in terms of what other meaningful interventions they might need on scene and where you'll be heading for this for, with this patient and your mode of transport, for example, by road or by helicopter. You can also assist with the extrication of this patient with our advanced modalities of treatment. 
in particular, the ability to be able to provide advanced analgesia, for example, ketamine, can facilitate the extrication of the process, the extrication of the patient much easier and smoothly. An example of this is that nothing slows down a fire and rescue team cutting a patient, a, 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 a vehicle apart or creating space in the extrication process than a patient screaming in pain. Everyone slows down, everyone acts slower to try and reduce the suffering of the patient. But as a medical team, one of the distinct advantages we can provide is a dissociative dose of ketamine or procedural sedation to be able to limb realign or actively manage them through a process that causes pain to them like a dashboard roll or release of compression. And that is a very, very big role that we can provide as a medical team. The other thing that's really important to make an assessment of is the nature of the injuries, what might happen through the extrication process in terms of where they are physiologically and how they're compensating for the nature of their injuries. And then simple treatments of in the vehicle. For example, treatment of catastrophic bleeding, and that could be by tourniquets or direct pressure. Although we don't see that as much as we used to in severe motor vehicle accidents um, these days due to the nature of the crumple zones and advanced engineering of motor vehicles. We might need to do simple airway maneuvers uh, and, surprise, and pr provide supplemental oxygen. We might place cervical spine collars or spinal mobilization or adequate immobilization of severe orthopedic injuries that we can in the motor vehicle. Although placement of pelvic splints in the seated patient can often be entirely unsatisfactory and needs to be done once the patient is out of the seated position. Breathing, we can provide supplemental oxygen, but we might decompress a tension in the pneumothorax in the seated position. Uh, if the patient's being positive pressure ventilated then and uh, severely circulatory embarrassed, then we might do a open finger thoracostomy. Uh, again, that might be the situation where we might be rapidly extricating the patient or asking for a plan B. Circulation, uh, we're, it's certainly IV access is an important goal to be able to get in the motor vehicle accident patient and it provides an access for us to be able to provide advanced analgesia. If they are extremely shut down or have limited access, then often a humeral head intraosseous access might be a suitable option. It's important to make a neurological assessment of the patient in the motor vehicle, including a formal GCS, the assessment of whether all four limbs are moving and what their pupils are doing. If you can, certain environmental conditions might mean that you want to provide protection from cold or bright sunlight or extremes of temperature, and that may or may not be able to be provided in the motor vehicle at that time but it's certainly worth thinking about. And monitoring, it's important to try and get some sort of as uh, access and monitoring, being mindful of the fact that that monitoring might be lost in the transition stage of extrication or removing the patient from the vehicle. So ketamine has really changed the nature of how medical teams involve themselves in the extrication of patients. It provides the ability to be able to do more complex extrications swifter and with the patients that are much less uh, exposed to pain and, and um, interventions where they might be at high risk of post-traumatic stress disorder. It's important to talk to the rescue agencies about what happens to the patient when they provide or they are given this drug, in particular that they might be able to then subsequently do more active extrication processes without the patient feeling any pain. They may still grunt or moan and they might need some airway support during the process of the ketamine dissociative treatment. It's important to realise that the medical teams may need to get inside the vehicle at various different stages throughout the extrication process to reassess the patient 
to keep an eye on whether the patient condition changes. And you might need to liaise with the rescue agencies to provide a time frame where you might stop the extrication process, inject yourself into the scene, step back out, let them do further extrication and have regular monitoring or access to the patient. Indeed, the medical team might need to stay in the vehicle even if it's on their side or upside down whilst the extrication process goes on, be mindful of the fact that there are certain stages where it might be too dangerous for the medical team to be in there with the patient. The next situation that's important to realise is that there might be multiple patients involved in these accidents. If there are multiple patients in one medical team, then Standard protocols often dictate that they'll have a standard medical kit dump and all the patients will be brought to that medical kit dump so that all the meaningful interventions can be provided about out of the adequate or the, out of the amount of equipment you adequately have on scene. This picture depicts two medical teams being involved in multiple patients. They're both undergoing rapid sequence intubation uh, and so it's important to make sure that the medical kit doesn't get confused between the two teams and that there are sufficient distance apart so that they're not intruding on each other's treatments but also that they're able to be uh, involved in each other's resuscitation and assist when needed. If there are multiple air assets involved it's important to liaise with the police early in terms of road closures, in terms of safety of the vehicles and in terms of any vehicle and movement um, patterns that might need to be done. It's also important to liaise with the pilots and air crew as to patient destinations, who might be moving first, and adequate control and safety of the helicopters on scene themselves. In vehicles that are in dangerous positions or where there are multiple patients in the vehicle, you might need to have a staged extrication plan for the serious or less serious patients in an order that deemed is the most safe for the patients involved and the rescuers involved and that they get them adequate treatment inside the vehicle as best as possible. This small mini has had a multiple rollover with multiple patients involved that have been removed through the back of the mini that the picture doesn't depict. Uh, however, multiple uh, treatment sites were uh, set up for the treatment of these patients so that they could be adequately treated in a timely manner. If there is a true multiple patient multi-casualty major incident type where there are multiple patients on buses or trains or other types of vehicles, further thought needs to be placed into assessment of patients triage, the establishment of a casualty clearing station or a medical treatment area with both egress and egress, ingress and egress of emergency vehicles into the site. A proper methane report should be passed as soon as possible so that the adequate amount of resources that can be deployed to the scene can be mobilised early and that destination hospitals can be prepared for multiple casualties. Another set of special circumstances important to realise is the patients, either pedestrians or pedal cyclists that have gone under vehicles that may or may not still be under large vehicles like heavy goods vehicles or lorries. This picture shows a pedal cyclist that has gone around a corner with a large goods vehicle, heavy goods vehicle turning left, has subsequently gone over the top of the cyclist and the cyclist is still underneath the vehicle. That, pa that patient may have severe injuries, they may still be trapped by either confinement or compression of the heavy goods vehicle. And so the medical team involvement needs to go through the standard approach, being safe, having proper PPE, having liaison with the fire and rescue team leader that's involved in the rescue of this, this patient. They need to be able to provide an adequate patient assessment as thoroughly as possible under the vehicle, provide adequate and appropriate advanced analgesia and then facilitate the extrication of this patient out of that environment. Being mindful of the fact that if a large compressive force is on that patient they may s uh, subsequently develop a severe circulatory embarrassment once that heavy 
compressive force has been released and the medical team needs to be ready for that with adequate provision of either blood or fluids, uh, tourniquets for catastrophic bleeding or a treatment plan for what happens if uh, they uh, lose their output. This picture shows a cyclist that has been run over by a large heavy goods vehicle. You can see a large amount of blood on scene, a pedal cyclist or a, cy uh, a bicycle that is underneath the rear wheel of this uh, heavy goods vehicle and some glasses that have been broken underneath the, the furthest road, uh, sorry, the furthest tire on the scene. Uh, these are very complex rescue situations with patients that may or may not be highly conscious with severe injuries and they are very difficult to manage from a rescuer's point of view. Looking underneath that heavy goods vehicle you can see quite important information that might be translatable for not only the mechanism of injury of the patient but also translated to the trauma team leader if possible. In this picture you can see that there is a large amount of human tissue and blood on the tyre of the vehicle and there are scrapes and uh, loss of the dirt underneath the undercarriage of the vehicle and uh, snag points where the patient has come into contact with the undercarriage of the vehicle. The large back rear assembly uh, of the vehicle is when, where the patient has had ultimate contact with and been compressed by that rear axle. So that sort of information can provide you and guide you as to where the injuries are on these patients and also have an indication of how long it might take to get them out of there and what other things you might need to be prepared for treating as the medical team. Other hazards such as collapsing or falling over fences, sharp prickly bushes in this instance where a child has gone underneath the front of a vehicle that vehicle needs to go through the standard six stages of extrication with stabilization, patient access, initial access, then creating space, and then an extrication plan. And if possible, the medical team involvement would be, again, initial assessment, going through the ABCs we've talked about with patient assessment, adequate analgesia, and then an extrication plan in liaison with the fire rescue service with a two steps ahead process cognitively of what's going to happen next and what meaningful interventions this patient might require. And if you look at the side of this screen, the side of this picture, you can see there are some pneumatic airbags that have been placed at the bottom section of the screen of the picture to uh, be able to lift the vehicle, often only a small amount, enough space to be able to then move the patient out onto a rigid extrication board or spine board. And that's all it took for this particular situation. Vehicles may not be standard road vehicles. They can be things like uh, this small tractor or backhoe that has been tipped over with a patient that has been trapped underneath. Again, this is a very similar motor vehicle accident or road traffic accident type situation. You can see that it's been uh, stabilized with stocks and chocks. And there's airbags in the center of the screen also to provide stability for that while the patient is being removed from underneath. You can see that there's lots of agencies involved, including fire and rescue, USAR, which is urban search and rescue team involvement, as well as medical team and ambulance teams. There are large numbers of people doing these jobs, and it's very important to realize that there's lots of interagency liaison that needs to be done to provide optimal patient care. So you've got the patient out. You now need to think of what happens next. So you can see this is a motorcyclist accident. They've been removed from the scene and placed into a position where there's a adequate kit dump, a stretcher at half height. The medical team is preparing to do a rapid sequence and intubation of this patient. The ambulance is facing the right direction to go to hospital. The stretcher is ready to be placed back into that ambulance and and swiftly moving towards the right hospital, the right major trauma center for that area. And that has all been planned out during the extrication phase to smooth the transition, keep the tempo of the job moving, and optimize the meaningful interventions that are provided on scene and the patient transferred as 
swiftly as possible to the major trauma center. Similarly, this show, photo shows the road traffic accident on the right of the picture with an ambulance in the fend off position with the medical teams doing a rapid sequence intubation and their meaningful interventions that may include provision of blood, finger thoracostomies, tranexamic acid, advanced splintage with both pelvic and long bone fractures, and then protective packaging to prevent cloth disruption, administration of osmotic therapy if needed, rapid sequence intubation with proper oxygenation and CO2 control, and protection of, pretension, pr protection of the brain and prevention of secondary brain injury for the multiply injured patient. And that's all done on scene with rapid transfer to the major trauma center. So you can see these scenes are chaotic. They can be assaulting four out of your five senses. They can be very loud. They can be very emotionally upsetting to look at. There can be lots of uh, sharp things and difficult things to be able to protect yourself from. And there can be enormous amount of cognitive load, as you can see, with the number of rescuers on scene. The large amount of debris, large amount of fuel and other hazards on scene. And you need to liaise with the crews that are on scene to optimise patient care. That stretcher that's on the right of the picture might not be in the best pit situation for where you might need to do your meaningful intervention. So you might need to move that. You might need to liaise with the police and tell them where you're going so that their other family members know where to go to see them or for them to follow up their patient care. So there's lots of things the medical team needs to be able to pay attention to. This is a familiar scenario for the Sydney HEMS team, that is the RSI and meaningful interventions performed at a stretcher full height at the back of an ambulance in Sydney. You can see that we have access to the rear auction outlets for the ambulance and a proper kit dump area that can be placed either on a second stretcher or on the back of the ambulance. And you can see that this patient's undergoing rapid sequence induction, further meaningful interventions, packaging and stabilization. And then they're placed straight back into that ambulance and then taken to a major trauma center in Sydney. So I hope this presentation has been helpful in providing a little bit of uh, the experience that we have in dealing with motor vehicle accidents, the importance of all these hazard identification and protection from, and the stages of extrication to optimize patient care. I just want to thank the relevant agencies that I've had the ability to be able to um, benefit from having trained with, and uh, there are some contact details for those organizations on the screen at the moment. Thank you very much.